previously on Doctor Who Literature. Well, hi everybody. Welcome back to Doctor Who Literature. My name is Jason, and I'm your host on this journey, this very long journey. I also contracted COVID, and I have no voice this week, to the extent that I've hired an actor to play me for this episode. Next time on Doctor Who Literature, we will hopefully resume our regular schedule, assuming my voice returns with episode 88, Doctor Who, the Aztecs. Thank you for joining me on another episode of the Doctor Who Literature Podcast. The role of Jason Miller was played by Conrad Westmus. Thank you for listening, and whatever you do, keep turning the pages. Hang on a minute. Where are my lines? Oh, I haven't got any. I'm canon, for God's sake. Honestly, Americans. Direction point! Direction point! A Doctor Who Podcast Network. Well, hi, everybody, and welcome back to Doctor Who Literature, the podcast taking you through the world of the Doctor Who novelizations put out by Target Books from 1973 onward in publication order. We're a member of the Direction Point Doctor Who podcast network. My name is Jason, and I'm your host on this journey, this very long journey. Last week... I lost my voice, so I had the vocal talents of Conrad Westmas, who kindly stepped in at short notice. But I'm back. Honest, it's me. I'll prove it to you. Um, oh, where's the Wikipedia page about the World Series? Oh! Jim. Jim. Jim! What are you doing? Great, you're back. Thank goodness. Um, I was just improvising, you know, just in case you weren't able to do this week's show. But I'm back. My voice is back. I've recovered from COVID. Seriously. Can I have my show back, please? Please? Jim? Jim? <clears throat> Not Jim. Jason. Also, is that really what I sound like? The uh, mutant love child of Isaac Asimov and Howard Cosell? I'll, 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 I'll go. I'll, right, bye. And the role of Jason in the previous comedy sketch was played by the great Jim Sangster. Thanks again, Jim. And also, thanks so much to Conrad. Conrad did a phenomenal job covering for me last weekend. Based on the initial audience feedback, I think most folks would prefer if Conrad were to just host the show, or at least narrate for me, on a regular basis. We have a lot of ground to cover this week, so let's hit the ground running. Two phenomenal reviews of Doctor Who literature have come over the transom, so let's hear what our reviewers have to say. First, on Twitter, we heard from Andrew Smith. Yes, that Andrew Smith, author of the 1980 classic Doctor Who serial, Full Circle, as well as the 1982 novelization of the same story, covered on episode 71 of this podcast, myself and Jim Sangster along for the discussion. Andrew writes, huge thanks to Jim at monster underscore maker for introducing me to a new fave podcast, the Doctor Who Literature Podcast. I was considering offloading my target novels, but not now. Glorious. Go listen wherever you get your pods. Thank you, Jim and Jason for rekindling my target love. A wonderful review. Thanks so much to Andrew. You will be hearing his voice on this podcast before too much longer goes by. Also on Apple Podcasts, we have a new five-star review from Great Britain from Mr. Dog 76 The review is titled Brilliant, Warm, and Full of Heart. I discovered this product pretty late in the day, but delighted that I have so much to go through and binge on now. Full of heart, warmth, and knowledge. This podcast has inspired me to dig out my target library and give them another read, and each new episode popping up has become a special Sunday. Thank you very, very much for that review. Great to hear from listeners. I'm glad that the sound of my voice every Sunday is not too much of a burden 
on your ears. Speaking of listeners of this podcast and contributors to this podcast, James Couray Smith has done it again with another phenomenal psychic paper substack essay this week on the Crotons. Now, the Crotons is the season six Doctor Who Patrick Troughton serial. The novelization was released in late 1985 and will be coming up on this show at some point within the next three months. I am a big fan of the Crotons. One of my earliest podcast appearances was in 2015 on an episode of Reality Bomb, bringing the Crotons to Gallery of the Underrated. The novelization also has special memories for me, which I will reveal when that episode comes up. Jim is not just looking at the Crotons from a nostalgic point of view. He's also discussing the story on its own merits. He has terrific things to say about it. Really should shake up your opinion of the Crotons if you are someone who is not very high on the story. I will put a link to that in the show notes. As with anything that James Couray Smith writes, I cannot recommend it enough. This week's episode is about the Aztecs, both the 1964 Season 1 William Hartnell historical serial and the 1984 novelization by the same writer, John Lucarotti. My guest this week is the great Ross Aitken from the Gallifrey's Most Wanted podcast family. Ross was one of my first guests and has been on the show many, many times over the last nearly two years. As always with Ross... The conversation begins in earnest long before I even get around to hitting record on Zencaster, so the conversation will appear to pick up in midstream. Since I was away for much of August, this conversation was recorded in July, on the morning of the day when I saw Oppenheimer in the theater, on the big screen, the very big screen, the IMAX screen, in Kipps Bay in Manhattan. Ross had not yet seen the movie either. But we spend a lot of time talking about the movie and about World War II history and about reactions to the movie. The movie was excellent. I'm not positive that it's one of the greatest movies ever made. I can say that now, recording this over a month after I've seen it. However, the performance by Killian Murphy as Oppenheimer is undisputably one of the best performances that I've seen as is the performance by Robert Downey Jr. as the film's antagonist, Louis Strauss. This past week, we were on a family vacation to Los Angeles. At the recommendation of my producer, David Barsky, I went to Iliad Books in North Hollywood. I have been trolling used bookstores anywhere that I go, whether that's Brooklyn or Providence, Rhode Island, or Los Angeles this past summer, in the hopes of rebuilding my New Adventures collection. Unfortunately, Iliad Bookshop did not have any of the New Adventures from Virgin Publishing from 1991 through 1997, but that's about the only thing that Iliad Bookshop does not have. They did have a few Target novelizations for sale, although I have those already, so I left them on the shelf for the next Good Faith buyer in due course. I spent a lot of time in their biography section, and I picked up two old autobiographies from a different era in American political life. I bought Jeb Stuart Magruder's book. That's his own take as a Watergate felon on the Watergate controversy, one of my favorite eras of American history. I've pretty much purchased every Watergate paperback over the years that I can get my hands on. This is actually the second time that I purchased Magruder's book. I bought it at a used bookshop in Portland, Maine many years ago. Unfortunately, I never got around to finishing, and that was one of the many books that I lost in the unfortunate purge of most of my Doctor Who and many other collections over the winter. Happy to have that back. But apart from the Jeb Stuart Magruder book, I also purchased Louis Strauss's autobiography. Strauss, played so vividly by Robert Downey Jr. in Oppenheimer, possibly the best performance that he's ever given in his incredible 40-year career. Strauss, again, is the antagonist of the movie, and the autobiography by Strauss is pretty hard to read. Lots of waxing rhapsodic about Confederate Civil War generals, and lots and lots of defensive whining. But if nothing else, the book does serve as the right-wing response to Oppenheimer the movie. I am finding it an interesting read, even if I am not certainly 
enjoying it. But when I was in Los Angeles, I also sat down with David Barsky in his spectacular home library, and we recorded a forthcoming episode, which I'll talk a little bit more about at the end of this program. But for now, I want to turn things over to Ross Aiken. As always, Ross and I had a lot to discuss, not just limited to the Aztecs itself. We had a phenomenal conversation. I'll play you the recording momentarily, but a word on the text. As I was writing my audio essay on the Aztecs novelization in July, I had a memory of Kate Orman, prolific Doctor Who novelist, and a guest on this program, episode 37, The Talons of Wang Chiang. I recalled that Kate, in the 1990s, had written a post on Rec Arts Doctor Who, critiquing some of the historical inaccuracies in John Lucarotti's novelization of the Aztecs. I found the post, and I reached out to Kate, hoping I would be able to tempt her to record the audio of that 30-year-old post for this episode. Kate, as it turns out, was eager to contribute to the episode, but she did me one better. She didn't just record her Rec Arts Doctor Who post from 1994. She actually dug out of the archives a fanzine article that she had written in 1992, a full-length article discussing historical inaccuracies in Lucarotti's 1984 novelization. Kate was good enough to record that for us, and I'll be playing that after the interview with Ross and before my own audio essay. So... After the break, my conversation with Ross, an audio essay written by Kate Orman, and then my own audio essay on Doctor Who, the Aztecs. Let's get to it. Traveling the Vortex. Are you ready to embark on an epic journey through time and space? Join the thousands of Whovians around the world who've discovered Traveling the Vortex, the ultimate Doctor Who podcast for diehard fans and curious newcomers alike. Every week, we dive deep into the Hooniverse, discussing the episodes, theories, and hidden gems. We dissect the Doctor's adventures, share behind-the-scenes stories, and explore the legacy of this iconic show. Travel in the Vortex brings fans together, fostering a global community of Whovians. Whether you're a fan of classic or new Who, there's something for everyone. Join us on this incredible journey as we unravel the mysteries of time and space. Don't miss out. Subscribe to Traveling the Vortex today on your favorite podcast platform. Traveling the Vortex. Your ticket to adventure awaits. Traveling the Vortex is a proud member of the Direction Point Podcast Network. You're listening to the Doctor Who Literature Podcast. Keep turning the pages. I liked it. I mean, it really, one, I liked the book. Thank you, because it wasn't as shitty as the last one. (laughs) 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 But it wasn't just, okay, it's just not as bad. It was just, that it was really good. I really enjoyed it. So before we talk about the book, have you seen Oppenheimer yet? No, I don't know. When my wife wants to see it, I do too. I like, I, my thing with Nolan is, is I like his movie. I love, I love Dunkirk. So I'm looking forward to this. Sometimes his other stuff is just a little, I keep, you keep trying to do the, tr- repeat the same trick. Right. And I'm just like, I'm not at that interested. His Batmans are okay. So I, but I'm like, I like his historical movies. Cause I thought Dunkirk, cause I'm a pretty savvy film viewer and it was about halfway through that oh this shit's happening and he's jumping from time he's not he's doing this way out of sequence he even tells you he tells huh? you at the beginning one week ago one hour ago uh, but one i just wasn't ago. i was just paying attention to the actors and i wouldn't i just didn't catch it because it was so it, i mean it was really well made and that's so. where oppenheimer seems like it's going to be fundamentally different from dunkirk and that Dunkirk was about primarily anonymous actors that you didn't know. And then when a famous face shows up, like Kenneth Branagh, you're like, oh, wait, who was that? Whereas Oppenheimer seems to be all about celebrity cameos, big name actors who are only in it for one or two or three. And it's it's that that part of a director's career where actors going, I'm not going to get a work to him, so I'll take the smallest part to be in one of his movies and actors do that i mean bruce willis made a fucking didn't make a living at it because he did shit for scale yeah you know he did he did uh shit um tenant uh, uh tarantino's second movie fuck 
Pulp Fiction. Pulp Fiction. That he did that for fucking scale. I just want to be in it. Yeah, and so I guess they do with everybody, and it's a tradition in these war. You know, I want to see it. How is it? I mean, but are the people badly cast? Or are they? You know, I have not seen it. I mean, this is being released in mid to late August. I'll have seen it for a long time by the time this comes out. My tickets are for next Friday, July twenty eighth. So I'm okay. about six days away from seeing it. You going at a? Do you guys? You going to a seventy millimeter theater? One of the few that's showing it. The IMAX in Kips Bay. Yeah. See, that's it. Is he shot it in seventy? Which that's another reason I want to see it because every movie um, I didn't really like Hateful Eight a whole lot. I thought it leaned into the violence. You know, sometimes he gets lazy. Was that Tarantino or uh, Nolan? That, that was Tarantino. Oh yeah. And but he shot it in seventy, mm. and it it was fucking beautiful. I mean, it was because Tarantino is a good director. It's just sometimes I think he he just I'm getting too much of Tarantino in it. I'd like to see you know you know some because he can do more. No, so. I don't think. Sorry, the reviews that I've read of Oppenheimer are starting to bother me because they don't focus on what the movie says. They focus on what the movie doesn't say. So well, that's, yeah. Oppenheimer, the movie, is based on the book American Prometheus. That's been out for about 15 years. It's a biography of Oppenheimer. I've now read two reviews that complain about Oppenheimer not because of the way it handles Oppenheimer's life story or the way it handles the celebrity cameos. It complains about the fact that the movie doesn't address the human cost of atomic testing after the war. Like, that's a different movie entirely. That's not the story. This is a story about them making it. That, you know, right. and he, you know, I, I hate that shit. It's I've I've stopped talking to people. I'm a fucking screaming liberal, you know, and I, I grew up. My father went to war a lot. You know, family history of it. So I lean toward, you know, I don't, I hate when you bash the military for just all everybody in the military is stupid. You can make them the bad guy. I don't give a fuck. But it's because that person's the bad guy, that individual's the bad guy. But when it comes to historical movies and, and this things is like, I won't talk about people go, oh, we should never have dropped the bombs Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And I go, fuck them. I need you to go to a fucking, go, go to on Google and Google rape of Nanking and then shut the fuck up. We were not the villains, <laughs> okay? In any way, shape, or fucking form, that was a mercy because that stopped the war because it would have just gotten worse. And they don't want to hear it. They just, it, they, it's, Japan is not a victim. They have never fucking apologized. I don't want to hear it. Their crimes are so bad that they will not apologize for them. As a nation, they just can't. I mean, I understand why they don't. They, it's a nation you can't, that's a too big of an apology to make. It's a stupid reason, but that's the reason. <laughs> yeah, not, not to get too far afield from the Aztecs, but I'm bringing all this stuff up for a point. Mm -hmm. John Grisham, who is about as left wing as you or me, wrote a novel about five years ago. Forget the name of it now. It is a book a year, so they all blur together. It was a book that took place in the 1940s about a southern farm owner who murders a priest and it turns out it has to do with what happened during the war when the farmer was a prisoner of war in the Philippines and the way that Grisham describes the Japanese army and their actions with regard to American POWs in the Philippines you would think the book was written to be the most fundamentally racist bit of anti-Japanese propaganda you would ever see the mm. problem is a lot of the stuff that he describes in the book actually happened yeah it they were they it's a cultural thing if you want i mean it's and they were the, you know they were fucking brutal they didn't believe in you know murder they didn't they thought if you surrendered you were a failure and this is not to call them out specifically we're talking about things that happened 80 years ago now uh american brutality during certain later wars is also worthy of movies in and of itself but speaking of cultural brutality I was reading the um, Elizabeth Sandifer book on the William Hartnell era, and this is based on blog posts that she wrote in 2011. I've had this book for a very long time, um, and I started reading the TARDIS Erudatorum blog probably in 20... It was after it became well-known. It was after she went to town tearing apart the Ark and Celestial Toymaker. 
readings of those two stories that I don't agree with, but that's, of course, a story for another podcast episode. Mm -hmm. But I hadn't read the earliest stuff, so rather than just go back and read the blog one post at a time, I got the ebook edition. Uh, she does not like a significant amount of of the Hartnell era. So I want to read to you her take on the Aztecs. And this ties into our conversation about Oppenheimer and the way that Oppenheimer does not address the victims, the early victims of the atomic age in the forties and fifties. I mean, if you want to do about them, if you want to do a movie about the making of John Wayne's, the conquerors and how that arguably got John Wayne and a significant amount of the, if I it killed it, yeah, it's not, a, it's, you know, it's just the math is this many people in that movie died of the same kind of cancer. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the same with the, the Philadelphia Phillies, the old veteran stadium. I read an article last year, the AstroTurf in that stadium killed a significant number of athletes who played there, including Tug McGraw. They all developed the same kind of cancer that is directly linked to what Monsanto was putting in the artificial turf. Jeez Louise. But again, that's not what the movie Oppenheimer is about. The movie it's about Oppenheimer the man. is about Oppenheimer, and it has to address – you can't do a 12-hour movie. So I love the Aztecs. I saw the Aztecs for the first time in late 1985. We'll get your heart and origin story in a moment. I think it's an incredibly made story. Every time that I watch it, my jaw drops in admiration for the actors and the way they're saying these lines, the direction. When I went to read – the Sandifer book, I was assuming it was going to be a victory lap and that she was going to love the same Hartnell stories in the same way that I do. No. So this is a quote from Sandifer's chapter. This is the ebook edition of the Aztecs. And I'm going to jump a little bit around. And she addresses an author named Lindy Orthia that I admit I've never heard of. And it says this other author, quote, explicitly calls out the Aztecs as one of the explicitly pro-colonial stories of Doctor Who and thus as one of its most problematic stories. The story features Barbara explicitly trying to change Aztec culture to abandon human sacrifice in the belief that doing so will allow the Aztecs to survive Spanish colonization. This trope may be more familiar to a contemporary reader as the underlying assumption of Mel Gibson's spectacularly racist epic Apocalypto, that the fundamental problem with pre-Columbian America is human sacrifice and that this constitutes an original sin that dooms the culture. This is followed by a screen on my Kindle, a screen-long parenthetical about Mel Gibson. Mm -hmm. But then at the end of that paragraph it says, at least Doctor Who has the decency to obliviously cast white British actors who ham their way through the parts thus giving the racism that smiling liberal face of willful ignorance that continues to protect discrimination so well. In terms of the issues of class, class and social justice, then the Aztecs marks not so much a turning point as an institutional collapse in which the tensions and ambiguities of the first stories, first Doctor Who stories, give way to unadulterated European colonialism, based, as always, not on overt racism, but on the far creepier image of what Rudyard Kipling called the white man's burden. And then there's a couple of pages written about Kipling, who's an author that Sandifer comes back to again and again, especially when she gets to Celestial Toymaker. Is she a Brit, or is she an American? American. Okay. Born in the 80s, as far as I know. Thus far, the Doctor is not clearly a figure of social justice. The flashes of a desire to help make the world a better place demonstrated against the Daleks have not really been seen since, with the Doctor primarily acting to save his own skin in more recent stories. Once the Doctor embraces the ethos of social justice, his failure to transcend the cultural biases of his writers becomes problematic, dot dot dot. He is an actively regressive character, upbraiding Barbara for trying to change history in the first place. So when I first read this about 10 years ago, I'm like, number one, first of all, what does that mean? Second of all, what does any of that have to do with the Aztecs? Third of all, I think she has a couple of valid points here. But as somebody told me during another recent interview that I haven't aired as of the date that we are recording this, some of the things that Sandifer says are more a reflection on her than on the stories that she's reviewing. Because we all bring our own cultural biases and some of the theories to the table. Well, that, yeah, no, it's yeah. Art is it's that I say it all the time on my podcast. Art is in the eye of the beholder. It is very much. It, it is a one. It is a. It's kind of like religion. That personal, you know, that personal relationship with God. It's also your personal relationship with art. 
I have you and me could watch the same thing. We probably I'm assuming we're both agree we agree on the love. I love assets. It is one of my absolute favorite Doctor Who stories ever. Um, and but my take on is it's always going to have my my take on is always going to be my take. I can't. You know what I mean? And I think from read what you read that. Yeah, that's her. She wants it to be something else. Right. And it's not. And, I, and she has valid points. Yes, white lady tries to save the brown people. Yeah, I don't think back then, for, I think for then, this was less of that for its era. That I think they show the Aztecs as a separate culture that is different than ours. The doctor is, this is their culture. You cannot change it. It is an historical fact. That's what I get. I don't hear, don't save the brown people. I hear... This is their culture. You do not get to change it because that's it is what it was. You have to we are we are observers. And that's interesting because this is the only Doctor Who story to treat the past as a sacrosanct sacros man. I'm all over the place today as a sacrosanct thing that cannot be changed. Yeah. You flash forward two years to the myth makers and all of a sudden. You don't give a crap. <laughs> God, he gleefully embraces it and plays with it. So, oh yeah, or it's oh, I'm accidentally the Romans. I'm accidentally a part of history. Mm-hmm. When he realizes and giggles that oh, I'm the. It's my fault that Rome burned. Wow. You know, uh, yeah, but yeah, I mean, I get some of that, but I think it was made in 1964. It was shot in early 64, and it was aired towards the end of the season, so probably spring, early summer of 64. So. You know, they don't have any probably Latin, you know, what we consider in America, you know, um, saw a stand up comedian talk about someone goes, you're you're Hispanic, but you're white. And he's like, yeah, you know, it's not all, you know, uh, so but Brown, I mean, it was the nature of it. We did it in America. We brought we we didn't let we didn't have in, in this country. We didn't let p- people of Indian heritage play Indians in our movies. It was mostly Mexican Mexican actors. The, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's just what it it's messed up. I mean, it's really messed up, but that's what it was. But yeah, because I think that's 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 not what this story is about. I mean, I think she's de- she, back to her pew view on it. She wants it to be. More than it can be and more than it was intended to be. It's like the reviewers of Oppenheimer criticizing that it doesn't focus on the downwinders. It's not what the movie's about. It, there, that, that is a story that should be told, but it's not the story that the book Oppenheimer is about. Yeah, I mean, that is one. And there are tons. There are other, the, God, who, the Dwight Schultz and Paul Newman were in it. Oh, Fat Man and Little Boy. Fat Man and Little Boy. Which is not a bad movie. It's okay. It's pedestrian. It's okay. It's 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 a docudrama uh, in the American style where a lot of stuff's wa- washed out, but that just shows the people in it. So you, John Cusack character. Right. That, that was, he was a real person. Yeah. Louis Slotin was a, was a real person. And in fact, I believe he was the inspiration for the incredible Hulk. Um, although of course in the incredible Hulk, the scientist is given a happier ending after being pelted with gamma rays. I don't know if that plot Saran is going to be in the Oppenheimer movie. I will find out by July 28th, but yeah, they took a lot of liberties with that particular character. He's whitewashed in a sense that he's taken from being a Jewish scientist to non-Jewish. And oh, that's right. I forgot about that. Yeah. In the um, in Fat Man and Little Boy, the character is killed before the bomb goes off in August of 45, whereas in real life, that demon core killed two scientists in 46, Slotin being the second one. Oof. Same core killed two scientists. They melted it down. It was called the Demon Core. Ooh. That's a pretty incredible story, too. Yeah, see, but yeah, but that's not what you're just going to see a movie about Oppenheimer, who was a man who knew what he had to do because he didn't want the Nazis to get it first. Right. And then it turned, I think in a lot of ways, it turned out to be exactly what he thought it was. And he was hor- horrified by it. And then he is attacked. He's attacked by his own government 10 years later, and he has a security clearance revoked because of his association with the far left. Yeah. So if you're going to tell that story, you can't tell the story about the human cost of the testing in the Southwest. Again, it's a valid story. With yeah. the Aztecs, I then go to the novelization. Well written. If you look at all three of Lucarati's books, and you and I are discussing another one in a few weeks, 
this is probably the best. Yeah, after reading this one, I'm really looking forward to that one because as I told uh, Jason before we started, thank you for not giving me, this one was so much better than the last <laughs> one because the last one was so terrible. <laughs> yeah, what is the last one? We've, we've covered some clunkers. <laughs> uh, oh God, I don't remember. I think I blocked it. It's not Curse of Peladin because I liked Curse of Peladin. That was the first one we did. Uh, we did Tenth Planet, which yeah. we both enjoyed. Android Invasion, which is a not a good story. War Games, which is phenomenal. Uh, Horns of Naimon. Horns of Naimon is a good book, but the TV story is um, not your not your, not your traditional doctor. I don't know. I don't know. I, I'd rather watch Graham Corden be Camp Queen of the Universe. So I think it's Android. <laughs> I think it's Android Invasion, the one that really. Android Android was the one that was really bad. It's actually worse than the story, and the story is terrible. Although at least in Android, Terrence leans into the fact that this is a bad story and he's going to tell us it's a bad story. And that's what the book is about. Yes, he's very unapologetic. Yes, I hate this as much as you do. Fuck you. So there's three problems that I have with the Aztecs book, and I'll get into this in the audio essay later. Um, however, from a technical standpoint, this is the best written of Luca Rotti's three books. It's the shortest that has the most shortest, direct, powerful sentences. By the time you get to the massacre, which I have a different guest to cover many, many months from now. The Massacre is written with very, very, very long run-on sentences, which is a problem the Aztecs book does not have. So number one... No, it was very short and sweet, but I think it, it, I, I think it captures what's on screen, and I don't think it fleshes it out, but the tone is slightly different, so it's a little darker. I feel the peril more because I get it created in my head. I just, yeah, I just thought this was real, uh, so well written and different enough. I would expect that it may have been based on Luke Garotti's original scripts, assuming he still had access to them. This is, of course, is written 20 years later. And some of the stuff that has changed for television does not appear in the book. And there's some stuff in the book that doesn't make it to TV and vice versa. Uh, three problems. Number one, historically inaccurate as to real Aztec culture. This I don't imagine he did a lot of research in between 1964. He went to a world book in his hallway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we all, we all had world book at home in the early 80s. Oh, God, no. Ours was on the landing. between. We had a stairwell that turned. It went up three. They had a little landing and then went upstairs, and it was right there. And I would just pull one down on a rainy Saturday and lay in front of the TV and just flip pages. My father had the entire east wall of our living room turned into a bookcase and the wall board of the garage. So there was one panel of the bookcase that was devoted to the air conditioner that was already there. World book was on the far left side of the wall behind a couch on the second shelf from the bottom. So getting the books was a bit of an adventure, but I spent a lot of time in that corner of the bookcase looking at the world books. Um, so second problem is I think the colonialism is a little more pronounced in the book the stuff that Sandifer talks about, there is a discussion in the book between Ian and Barbara, which does not quite match the corresponding discussion on TV. I'll read it later. The gist of that discussion is Ian is, they're all like the Toxel. None of them are worth saving. So that's Ian taking on a pretty negative, yeah. regressive viewpoint. Yeah, okay, that's true. I didn't do, Normally when I do these, I, do, I watch it, I read it. If there's an audio book, I may listen to it because I want to hear... You know, just one, there's some, William Russell was reading this one. It was on sale for four, six bucks. I wouldn't get it. But I didn't get to watch it this time. And I, but I've watched the Aztecs. Probably it's, I may have watched it more than any other William Hart now because it's my go to when I would do a little mini. I would every once or twice a year, I would just pick a story from each doctor at random and watch mm. But I would like, I always pick, I pick this one a lot because I like the historical so much. During the 50th anniversary year, BBC America was doing a strand where every week they would show a serial from one classic doctor with a documentary about that doctor. I bought those sets. I have, I loved them. I enjoyed the hell out of them. And the Aztecs was the story they showed for Hartnell, but it was, it was yeah, not the cleaned up it. DVD vidfire edition. It was the old 1980s Lionheart release. I think when they did the DV, the DVD version of it, like I bought, I think they pulled the DVD recording. I last watched Aztecs during my Twitter 
pilgrimage. So in this case, this would have been the tail end of 2020. But when I read the novelizations for this podcast, I keep the transcript open, and I read a chapter, and then I read the corresponding scenes in the transcript, and I look for the changes, and I remark upon those in my audio essay. And then I go to my digital copy of the Aztecs, and I pull about five or four or five scenes that I want to drop into my audio essay. So I watch four or five scenes that way and compare them to how they're described in the book. So I'll be dropping in the audio of that scene between Ian and Barbara, which is much harsher, and it puts Ian in a much worse light. Yeah. This is, the, this is Barbara's story. And t- on TV, it's Barbara's story. Right. And when you say it's colonialist, Barbara is somebody from the latter days of the British Empire who is trying to change the past because she thinks what happened to the Aztec civilization is wrong. That's literally what the story is about. So yeah. when you criticize the story for being colonialist, no, this is somebody from the actual 1963 who has her own perception of the Aztecs. And that's exactly what she would try to do. She would try to save them. Like, you're, if you do this, you're weak. You, you're not going to have what you need to fight what is coming, which is far more horrible. And what I'd forgotten is that as much as the doctor tells her you can't rewrite history, not one line. In part four, the doctor tells Kamika the same thing. Your civilization is going to destroy itself. And she goes, you're right. Yeah. Your civilization will be devastated by Cortez. And most of the Aztec population will survive, but they will be – subservient to the Spanish, they will be devastated by disease, and people of Aztec lineage will still survive into the 20th century, but they will not have ownership of the continent anymore. So that's all things that could have conceivably have been said in 1963. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, because you also got to take art when it was created. Mm-hmm. It's going to have its cultural biases. A lot of people, you know, I, I art is changing because of the way people perceive it. Now, it, it, it changed from then to the 80s. You know what I mean? It changes as the cultural mores change. It's going to change. But this was created in 1964 with a liberal intent to have a liberal message. You know, um, most television people, especially in this era, is that, that it's whatever, it's that, there was a wave of liberalism post Second World War because the vets came home and went, I've seen hell and I don't want it. Right. I've seen people killed for their for being different. So I don't want that in my country anymore. That forties liberalism, that I call it that noble liberalism, which was color which was had blinders on at times because it was a bunch of white folk <laughs> trying to make up for something bad. Um in a way. So, you know what I mean? It's so, but it's changing. So, I mean, you got to look at this. I, I think when she looks at it, she's looking at a, a much, someone who from, comes from a world that is, is much more blunt. I'm not blunt. I don't want um, much more worried about the bigger picture. I think this is the best story that somebody born in the 1930s, Luca Rotti, could have told given his cultural perspective and given what we knew. And given that as Aztec information would have been harder to track down in the 1960s, now we go to Wikipedia. There's online encyclopedias. You read this stuff. You know more in 45 seconds than he would have known after three weeks. They hadn't even translated the glyphs yet. They didn't do that until the 80s. Yeah, the codex, right? Is it, yeah, they didn't. They didn't find. They hadn't translated the codex, so they didn't know probably one tenth of what we know now. And there is a great documentary, and I forget its name, that I've, but I've watched it like three times about the whole story of them finally translating the codex. All the different things that got to a certain point until this one guy found the final piece. And then it was like, oh, wow, we, were, we have way more, more information than we did before. Right. You know what I mean? So, yeah. It, you know, and then you're also telling the story of the Aztec culture in... Not even a hundred minutes. Right. 25 minutes per week, but one minute is opening credits, one minute is closing credits. And because you don't have previously in 1964, five minutes of each episode is restaging conversations that happened the previous week to recap mm. the story. Soap opera so, style. Yeah. So there's maybe 60 minutes of out of the hundred that are original, unique, forward going storyline. The rest of it is recap. Yeah, I can't wait till they do season one. I'm hoping they have the omnibus version of this because I want to see it again. Because I, I don't have my youth because that's how I saw it. It was a movie. Right. I think it works. The history nerd in me likes it. I, I, 
I love this. I love the TV show as one. And I did like the book. I thought the book was had a different tone. It was much darker to me. For me, the best part of the Blu-rays, and I know Chris Chapman has said on Twitter they're working on a 60s set. There's one coming out fairly soon. They have they they should probably do a Trouton at some point. But I really think that season one, the only part of season one that is missing is Marco Polo. You got the little condensed version on right. the in the beginning set. Is that where it's at? I don't think I've ever watched it. Uh, but you could you could do a reconstruction. You could you could do a reconstruction. Like when they released Crusade, they released the two missing parts of Crusade as a basic tell us not reconstruction with production note commentary. So I think season one is almost there. But what I want to see is the earliest versions of the scripts that they can find. When you read the camera scripts on the season two Blu-ray box, that you can see what lines Hartnell didn't remember in studio and what he changed. See, I don't have a I don't have a none of my computers can read the blue. I don't have to buy now. I specifically got a BD-ROM external drive to plug into this laptop, uh, so I can, and then I set my computer to Region Two so I can watch these Blu-rays on, on the laptop. Uh, so I'm getting the UK. I get the UK version whenever I can, so I can do the Trap One um, episode. Yeah, yeah, twenty. I had I had Mark Cockerman for uh, the Mutants, Third Doctor story, and I was telling him we get. The clamshell, and that's why we get it late. And we get so they announced the 20th season the same week we got the one before. Right, yeah. And it and the gaps are bigger. I think that will speed up once the new show once it's they start to because it, you know, it being on Disney and it Davy, it's gonna generate a lot of buzz and there's gonna be a spike in watching. If do they if they can maintain it is the the trick. And, you know, Davies was like, let's merchandise this stuff. Let's do spinoffs. Let's do as much as they'll let us do. For so. the season that I love, I will get the UK version, which comes in a nicer set, and I'll watch it right away, and I'll do the Trap 1 panel. For a season that I you know, don't love as much, I'll get the American version. I want to buy the American version so they keep making them. But for season one, for season two, I want to get that as soon as it comes out. I want to watch it in the original packaging. And I want to look at the BD-ROM stuff because I want to read those earlier versions. Yeah, I had a bunch of those and I sold them um, because I was buying both because I'm just that nerd. So, But I really look forward to, you know, the I, I really loved the season two set. Yeah. I really did. It was nice. They looked gorgeous. And reading Verity Lambert's memos in the early part of the season two, I think we talked about this. Um, you and I have done an episode on Dalek Invasion of Earth, which is coming out on Gallifrey's Most Wanted. I don't think it's released yet. Yes, today. Oh, okay. Well, today or tomorrow. I'm going to have to. So by the time it, my listeners hear this episode, they will probably have already heard you and I talking about Hartnell. But just to paraphrase what I said on your show, which we recorded last month, if you read the memos that Verity Lambert writes, which are now saved in the production file on the season two Blu-rays BD-ROM, she is very unsentimental about getting rid of getting rid of Caroline Ford. In fact, she wants to get rid of Jacqueline Hill, who was her friend before they did the before they cast her as Barbara. She wanted to get rid of Jacqueline Hill at the same time. That fortunately never happened, and Jacqueline Hill stays around till the latter half of the season two production block. Um, so she is a very strong producer and she's keeping tight control over the cast and she's criticizing them for taking unscheduled half days on the Thursday, which is the last day of rehearsal, I think. So it's interesting to watch her and to read what she has to say. I want to read the memos that she was writing when the show wasn't established yet because there's a gap between them filming Unearthly and the Daleks and Edge of Destruction and before the show becomes a massive UK phenomenon. I want to see what her memos were like in the early, early part of her producership. And I want to read, if they still have it, I want to read the earliest versions of the Aztec script because there's a scene in the book where Othlock basically says, I've heard about Christianity. I want to convert to Christianity. I'm paraphrasing. That's not what he says in words, but I'll read it out later in the program. I want to know if that was scripted for television and deleted because that particular exchange does not happen in the corresponding scene on TV. And that's my biggest problem with the Aztec novelization. Not the notion that, yes, the Aztec civilization is going to be devastated. That is a historical fact. The fact that what Lucarati is saying in the book is Christianity is a better way, and I, as the one Aztec character who is going to be saved, I am going to actively seek it out. 
that I have a major, major problem with. Yeah. And that leaves a sour taste yeah. in my mouth with the book, even though I still love watching the TV story. Yeah. Well, that's true. I mean, it's that, that back, back to that cultural thing. It's like, you know, that, especially when he wrote this. And when did he write this book? 1984. It is published in early 84. Probably wrote it in 83, but it was about 20 years from the production of the original to the production of the book. Okay. Yeah, because I don't think I ever read. I have all the books, but I don't think I read them all. And I don't know if I'd read this one. I mean, I couldn't remember reading it. So, which is a good thing because it kind of made it. But when was I can't remember the last time I watched the Aztecs. It may have been. And I've watched it since me and Vic talked about it. In terms of the original DVD, it was the first fully vid-fired 1960s story. Because they had been experimenting with Vidfire, and if you look at the original Tomb of the Cybermen release, they have as an Easter egg the Doctor Victoria scene in Part 3 of Tomb of the Cybermen, Vidfire, as a bonus feature in Easter egg. Aztecs was the first 60s story to get the full Vidfire treatment, so when you're watching it, you're watching it as if you're watching the original videotape. And then they had to do some restoration yeah. work because it revealed some blank portions of the set that wouldn't have been visible on a 405 line television. Yeah. So did they vid fire it between the VHS and the blue DVD or did they do it for the VCA v, VHS? I, had, I wasn't collecting all the VHSs cause I had my off air copies. So I don't actually know. I think the Aztecs DVD was the very first use of vid fire in, in the line. Okay. Ever. Cause I had it because I bought them all and then DVD came and I bought them all and, they eventually ended up in a Goodwill store here. <laughs> it shows you the remarkable work that the DVD, the restoration team, is doing. We're both baseball fans. About 10, 15 years ago, the administrator of Bing Crosby's estate is going Found through... Found that Pirates game. That's right. So Bing Crosby was a part owner of the Pittsburgh Pirates. He is too nervous to watch the 1960 World Series, so he goes to Europe so he doesn't have to see it. And he has the games kinescoped. He has somebody film camera CBS, yeah. video broad, and the video broadcast no longer exists. The earliest surviving World Series broadcast is from 1952, but between 52 and 1967, they are missing a significant amount of World Series games. From 1968 onward, we have I think almost every World Series game, the original video broadcast, with some missing pieces here and there, including the World Series game played the day that I was born. They're missing a portion of that on video, but they have most of it. But they didn't have any of the 1960s World Series as surviving video, only the radio broadcast. And then when they're going through Bing Crosby's garage decades after he passes, so he dies in the 70s, they find the actual film cans for Game 7 of the 1960s, one of the most famous World Series games ever played. Here's a swing and a high five. And nobody had the TV video call of Bill Mazeroski hitting the first walk-off home run in World Series history, which, by the way, just devastated my father watching that as a 16-year-old boy in Brooklyn. Um, mm-hmm. So, But when they release the kinescope, the Bing Crosby privately held film of a long-lost video, they didn't vidfire it. They didn't restore it. They – Probably, have they given those film cans to the restoration team? They might have been able to release Game 7 of the 1960 World Series as a colorized video rather than as grainy black and white kinescope if the restoration team had been, had been gotten involved. Yeah, that's that. I would love that. There are little clips on YouTube of early World Series and stuff, but that's about it. It's really rare. And I've seen bits and pieces of that. They aired that or did. Did they release that version of that game? They probably released a DVD version of that game. I know that they did a theatrical screening of it in Pittsburgh. Michael Keaton was sitting there on the front row as one of the more famous natives of Pittsburgh. So it got a it got a big release at the time. Uh, but there must have been a if, if there is a DVD, I don't have it. I do have a download that later popped up on YouTube, but I do not have a DVD release of Game Seven. Yeah, because that'd be interesting. I've watched little bits and pieces, you know. 
that game that game was played fast. It was over in a little more than two hours, even though the final score was ten to nine, and there were no strikeouts in the game. Imagine playing a game in twenty twenty three with zero strikeouts. Um, I haven't watched any games in two years because of how bad my team's ownership is. I am searching for a new team for in case they move. They could still stay, you know. It's it's base it's baseball. They're dodgy as shit. Um, so. Well, the, o- Oakland is drawing two thousand fans a night, and then when that's but that's because the owner wants them to draw two thousand fans a night. That's right. It's 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 major league the movie. That is not because the fans aren't coming. It's because you've made it too expensive yes. for them to come. And you're a dick. <laughs> <laughs> he's a, he's a, he he doesn't care. He's one. He, it doesn't matter. Vegas beware. He's not going to spend any money. He doesn't spend any money on his soccer team, and they got their stadium. He doesn't care. He doesn't care. <laughs> Just he's a horrible human being. Just avoid him like the plague. And uh, we've had this conversation before. The Oakland A's are the baseball team that defeated my team, the Mets, in the World Series the week that I was born. But I happen to like the A's, and I think it's a shame what's happening to them right now. No, I, you know, I wasn't even – I picked them because I was born in this city, even though they didn't get there until I was four. Mm. Yeah, they'd been in Kansas City before that. Kansas and then Philly. So we have been talking a lot about Oppenheimer. We've been talking about mm-hmm. John Wayne, Mel Gibson, <laughs> Bing Crosby, Bill Mazeroski, the 1960 World Series, Christianity, the, the Aztec Codex. Let's talk about you, because we're towards the end of the recording. Mm-hmm. When would you, Ross, have first seen any of the Hartnell years? Uh, when my brother started giving me VHS types, when we, when our the the Maryland, I think it was the Maryland Public Broadcasting Company, because in DC you get Maryland, DC, Virginia. Well, Virginia Public Broadcasting is a fucking joke. Um, but on that, and I would have seen it in the omnibus format. <clears throat> and I would have seen it. I would have seen probably all of Davison and then, well, maybe, maybe all of Davison. And then we got, we would, it went back to the beginning and then we had to wait for Colin Baker until it had gone through everything. Wow. Because that was the first time we got everything. And I would, I fell in love with it. Cause I wanted to see these historicals, you know, I was Jones in to see these because I'm a big history nerd. I'm like, I still, I love the his, I like that Chibnall brought historicals back more so than De, uh, Moffat had and uh, even maybe Davies. But it's like, can we have one that's just a historical? Right. I don't need a science fiction point to be there. Just be witness to an event or a, a era so you can, you know, uh, Highlanders, which is not the greatest historical but it's just about being in scotland at that time right and being a witness to a culture so and that's i loved him and i yeah it would have been so i would have been in college wow. because i would have had to go home and watch him with him uh, and then he had to he made copies for me he just he tied a dip uh, you know we Daisy chain VCRs. So what year would this have been on your first watching the Hartnell? 84, 83 or 84. I graduated high school in 83. My f- Our PBS station would have gotten the Hartnell package in 1985. We aired Unearthly Child in September 85. So I would have seen the Aztecs in 1985, right around the same as you. Yeah. So, and it was cool. And they were, you know, I think Hartnell's era has taken has had a re- renaissance in the last say ten years. Yeah, um, I think especially after Twitch, the twi- that first Twitch watch along. London 1965 became a meme for a long time thanks to Twitch. Yeah, because all these you know people in their twenties who were like, "Oh, old Doctor," and they had never seen it because in England they don't rerun it. Right. Well, I'm a Doctor Who fan because I started watching in 2005. And, oh, it's that cheesy old stuff. And that the fact that they watched, they started with Hartnell, it made them fall in love with all the doctors, I think. You know, I think Classic Who gained a lot of younger viewers. I think the Twitch view, first view, on is probably it is a major event in Who history. Because you had the different generations. You had, oh, I just watched New Who because I was 10 years old in 2005. And then... Later, they watch Twitch and they go, oh, I was 
I, this is actually some really good television. And they weren't being critical of it. They were not doing critical Sandiferian readings. They were taking it on its own terms. No, they just sat there watching it with their friends and chatting about it online. Yeah. It was a social thing. It was soft. It was familiar. And uh, and they bonded as a group. I think that's a tight group of bands. I'm on Twitter and I have some of the, I follow some of these people. I don't jump into their feeds, but I see them and they're having a good conversation and they're good. And a lot of them just became classic. A lot of them just became classic Who fans. And I loved it. I just, you know, and I, I mean, me seeing him first time made me really go, oh, I'm going to like this stuff. I was, you know, 11 when I first saw Unearthly, turned 12 a few weeks later. So I watched all of the Hartnells and Troutons at ages 11 and 12. And how did it read for you? I mean, how did it? I mean, bearing in mind in 1985, this stuff is only 20 years out of date. If you are a kid watching Friends now, Friends now is 30 years old. So the stuff that kids are watching now is older than the Aztecs was when I first watched the Aztecs. And having grown up in the 70s with a black and white TV, I didn't have to relearn the language of black and white TV. I was just taking... Yeah, I'm the same way. We didn't we didn't have a color TV until like 1973 or 74. So my kid doesn't like black and white. I grew up with it. It imprinted on me. So for me, I can watch black and white as easily as I watch color because that's how I grew up. Everything was... I was watching baseball in black and white until 1985. So... That's how I'm used to things, and it's just because your did, did, was that just because your black and white TV hadn't died, so your dad was not buying a new TV. I was I inherited the old 13 inch rabbit ear black and white when my parents got a color oh, okay. TV and hooked up to the local cable system, so I had a hand me down. Oh, okay, okay, and that's and that, that 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 finally failed and was taken out of service in 1980 end of 1984, and starting in 1985, every house in the television was color. Okay, see, we only had one TV, and then we had a portable black and white for when mom was like, get the hell out of the living room. I want to watch my story. You can go watch your cartoon sitting on the floor in the kitchen. We had the 19-inch color TV hooked up to cable in the early 80s, and my father would wake up at 3 in the morning, and he would turn on WGN, and he would tape the old 1950s sci-fi movies being aired in the middle of the night because he wanted the whole collection of the stuff he grew up with. My job, when the blob, the Steve McQueen blob came on the air in the early 80s, my job was to sit there with the old wired remote control on the VCR. It was a top-loading VCR. And pause at the commercials? And when I was 10 seconds late, coming back from commercial, I got in trouble. Because <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't unpause it in time. That would have been me as if I was a parent, because I could have been a parent, you know, with my kid, you're going to learn how to pause so I don't have to. But back then, they were bumpers. And now, we rejoin the blob, already in pro- But there was one... Or you learned it, or you got good at it, you know. I, I remember doing that. I made... Um, this is how nerdy I was. I had a buddy who... I, we were talking about watching Star Trek, like making... Like, you made a mixtape. So I made a Romulan storyline, only Romulan episodes, and I just took... Because we had been taping Star Trek off. And then, you know... I did it with other things. So I would make a, like, here's all the time travel story, mm. you know, and I would sit there with two remotes. And- but there was one commercial break in the blog where they didn't do a bumper and now back to our show. So I didn't realize that it was the actual movie and not a commercial because I'd never seen the movie before. So yeah, that, okay. that was an awkward con. And now of course the blob is out on DVD and uh, you don't have to worry about off air copies edited for content with no commercials anymore. Okay. Oh, God, no. I see. Because I watch two, I watch some of these commercial channels like Tubi and stuff like that sometimes because I'm just bored with what's on. And they have commercials. And I'm like, going, is this a TV? I start to go, is this an old TV edit they've got? Because I don't hear about TV edits anymore. You don't have TV. You don't show motion pictures on the main networks anymore. That's how I'm watching Dark Shadows. Dark Shadows is on Tubi. I'm about 45 episodes in. This is before it turns into science fiction. But the episodes are only 21 minutes and 45 seconds. I'm like, would a soap opera in 1966 have only been 21 minutes and 45 seconds? Or did yes. they cut three or four minutes out? No. No, they had a lot of fucking commercials. Yeah, you get more uh, You get more commercials during the daytime. Primetime, it was uh, uh, seven minutes. And that's why they're called soap operas, because they were selling soap to housewives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They did that when they were on the radio, because some of the ones my mom had watched had started on the radio. Um, but yeah, no, seven minutes. Because a regular television show, there'd be 14 minutes of commercials. 
every hour. And the the extras, not not the regulars, but the the actors who show up for one or two episodes in Dark Shadows in the sixties all become major sitcom stars in the seventies. Conrad Bain is in the very first episode of Dark Shadows. He was on different strokes for ten years. Barnard Hughes, Abe Vigoda will show up. Harvey Keitel is an extra in a very early episode of Dark Shadows. Really? I watched it some when it came back. My brothers remember it. Both of them remember it. Because when did it start? 60? 66. So my brother Huey would have been, if I was two, he would have been 12. Right. And he watched it. He always watched soap operas. He watched them. Yeah, he, I think he still does. I think he still watches General. It's General Hospital is still on. He's probably still watching. It's one of the last two soaps that is still on broadcast TV. Is it? Yeah, I remember when it went sci-fi when I was a senior in high school. Yeah, it was a sci-fi. The sci-fi Channel aired Dark Shadows. No, I'm talking General Hospital had a summer where it was sci-fi. I, oh, I didn't know that. Wow. Oh, yeah, yeah. The evil Cassidines had an, a freeze ray. And uh, Luke and Laura had to go to the island and stop them. I did not know that. It was on during the summer. It was a big event. Google it. It was my brother. And I think I discovered marijuana by that point. Yeah, I had. (laughs) So I was, we were watching it going, okay, what's this? I was going to say sci-fi channel made the dark shadows a staple of their original. Oh yeah. For about a decade. And I watched a lot of it when I was in law school. Was that twilight zone? They had, they had doctor who for a while. They had the time life doctor who package seasons 12 through 15. Yeah. With commercials. Yeah. But they never did, they never, Sci Fi Channel never showed General Hospital the Sci Fi season. It was just one. It was really weird. They were trying anything. Um, and the Luke and Laura thing was huge. It was huge. It was, it was on the, it was on magazine. It was everywhere. It was like a mini fad. My soap, to the extent that I had one, would have been all my children because my daytime babysitter in the late 70s and early 80s, everything stopped for all my children. So at one o'clock I am brought into the TV room. We watched Ryan's hope at 1230 and all my children from one to two and all my children, Sarah Michelle Geller, that was her, that was her second, was her first major soap. Got her Buffy. And in one of the very last episodes of all my children, they brought her back for a single episode playing Buffy. Oh, that's cool. That's there's there's cool. a single scene Sarah Michelle Gellar cameo, one of the last episodes of All My Children. It's basically a Buffy uh, homage. Yeah, well, the fine, the 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 big thing in all the like the DVD things with Buffy is that she could cry, she can cry on cue, which is yeah. a neat trick. But um, no, in my household, it was Days of Our Lives and Match Game seventy three, which is a mm. game show hosted by um, Peter Marshall, not Peter Marshall, G, uh, G, some Barry. There was Peter Tamarkin and Peter Marshall, two game show hosts named Peter. Yeah, no, but no, it was uh, it was a it was someone else. It was a comedian, and I can't remember his name. But it was back to back, and you could not bug my mom. You could come in the living room, you sat quietly, and she would be sitting there ironing my dad's shirts, drinking either scotch or bourbon. She drank crappy bourbon or sherry, and you had to be quiet for that hour. It's like, dude, my story is on, and my game show's on, and she'd sit there, and you know, she had a little thing of water to splash on the thing, and then she had her drink. My daytime babysitter was all about. Family Feud with British actor Richard Dawson, and then the ten thousand dollar pyramid with Dick Clark. Yeah, oh God, that was, yeah, my that was I watched those religiously. Ages five and six, I had my soap and my game shows. <laughs> yes, because you know we had crap TV. Uh, but no, I that was a, almost a Gallifrey's Most Wanted level tangent. Um, I, I'm not going to edit on a second of that. It's all staying in exactly as recorded. <laughs> all right, so let's let's finish up the Aztecs and move on to our own game show portion of the episode. Damn. So you can watch the you you watch the Aztecs more than any other Hartnell historical. I think I have, yeah. I really, it's my go-to because one, he has historicals, and if I watching a and for a while the only we had so little trout and it was two Messiah men or the dominators were your go-to for years you know because there was so much missing and i really but for Hart, for hartnell it was like okay i have a couple good really good historicals i want to i want to have at least one historical in this rewatch i think the only historical ish one i would ever do would be uh god the davison one with the terraleptals the visitation 
I will want, I like the, I'm a fan of the visitation. I can watch it. It's comfort. It's not great Doctor Who and it's not great TV, but it's, I enjoy it. Mark from Trap One, our mutual friend, yes, was my guest for the visitation because we did the pot, we did the podcast and the TV episode. That's episode seventy of this podcast. Visitation was the very first Davison novelization. But I want to ask you: there are ten Hartnell historicals, not counting the pseudo historicals, not counting the Time Meddler, and I'm not counting the two episode Ancient Egypt plot strand of Dalek's Master Plan. There are 10 full Hartnell historicals from Tribe of Gum, Unearthly Child 234, that's the first, and the last is The Smugglers. Out of those 10, which do you think is the best Hartnell historical? For pure entertainment, the Romans. Yeah, I like that one a lot. I think it is, it is it, a perfectly written comedy with enough action in it for, you know, you give all the heavy stuff to w William Russell and everything else is farce. And it's well-written, it's well-directed, it doesn't take itself too seriously, and William Hartnell freaking shines as a comedic actor. It has a slight problem with endorsing Christianity, but at least then that is a mutant. It's a historically accurate right. thing that's going on. That, and I think it's I think it's very subtle because you don't know the guy's a Christian till the end, why he's being nice. And, and, and after he's already murdered multiple folks earlier in the story. But yeah, it's, that's only yeah. a single mute shot, whereas in the Aztecs novelization, it's a full flat on, full throat endorsement. So. Yeah, yeah. No, I think, I think that's, as much as I love this one, I, I mean, the Romans is... There's a stretch of who in that second season. And it's just so good until you get to the until you get. Uh, I, I'm not a big get watching the Space Museum on the box set. But we talked while. about this on the Gallifrey's Most Wanted episode we did for Dalek Invasion of Earth. Season two is so mm -hmm. diverse, and when you get to season five, oh, God. Peter Bryan is oh no, we're stuck in Lime Grove D. We're going to have to do one base under siege story after another because we don't have the space. But you give Lime Grove D to Verity Lambert. Oh, okay. We're going to do an alien story set on the planet Vortis. Then we're going to fight the Crusades. Then we're going to go to an alien museum. Then we're going to have the TARDIS land on seven planets in six weeks on the chase. Verity Lambert was able to do a lot more with her resources than the Trouton era was able to do in season five, even in the same studio space. Yeah, she was pushing the envelope. Yeah, she, you know. I think the massacre might be the strongest historical. Yeah, if I if I could see it, it may be because, you know, I do love the massacre and I'm unapologetic about my love for that one. I want that one found. It's it it talks about a touchy subject. Uh, it doesn't take sides. They're all fucked up. It's this is a stupid argument. You're killing each other over a stupid thing. It is. They do not. And you know what I mean? It's just P and Stephen is like, what is wrong with my people? The massacre is difficult to sit through because it's a full on tragedy. The doctor doesn't help anybody. Hartnell's doctor isn't in it. I think the Aztecs is possibly the most fun of the Hartnell historicals because it's super well made. We have some issues with the underlying dialogue and so does Elizabeth Sandifer. But the way the Aztecs is performed, Hartnell... Jacqueline Hill, never been better. They set the screen on fire. John Ringham yeah. turns up in The Smugglers as well, but he's playing a good guy in The Smugglers, so the performance isn't as memorable. And same in Colony in Space. He's playing a good guy in Colony in Space. This, Who's he in Colony in Space? He is Ash. He is the head of the colonists. Oh, God, I never realized that. And that's another story with a Christian element. In the novelization, Ash kills himself because he's been reading the Christian Bible and wants to be more like Jesus. And he wants to. Was there some evangelical wave in, for middle aged and you know, old TV writers in England? At... But Malcolm Hulk wrote that novelization. Malcolm Hulk was a communist. <laughs> that, 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 he was a member of the Communist Party. He would not have believed that. I think he was more talking about the fa the tragedy that religion forces people to kill themselves. Okay, that makes more sense for Malcolm Hulk. I, I, don't, I don't see him endorsing uh, 1980s-style Christianity. But it's, it's, it's a memorable chapter in the novelization. And the novelization, Doctor Who and the Doomsday Weapon, is one of the greatest things ever. Far better than the novelization. 
of asset, of asset. Yeah, I think the book of the book of that is much better. And I I think the book of that is story is much better, but I've found I've come to like that story. I have prop some of the props are terrible and stuff like that, and that stuff bugs me. No, I, I am a big fan of Colony in Space, and I will never apologize. Already covered that on this podcast. But turning back one last time to the Aztecs, the Aztecs, mm. even though I acknowledge that some of Sandifer's points may be valid, even though I have problems with the novelization, when I watch the Aztecs, I am never not mesmerized. I think every part of it works. No, the the acting is beautiful. They give Hartnell and the and the, the actress that plays the the Aztec woman are wonderful. You know, it's just it's just it's a well made TV show for its time, and you got to take it as that. Absolutely. So yeah, the Aztecs I can just watch over and over again, and I think it's probably one of the best of the Hartnell historicals. Maybe not as well written as the Massacre, but I think it really, really holds up well. And the novelization, not so much. And I'll talk about that after the break. But before we get to the break, let's play twenty questions. So you know the drill. You've been on this show several times before. I am one Doctor Who serial between 1963 and 2022 using a series of 20 yes or no questions. You are going to guess which Doctor Who serial am I. Question one. Um, is it a black and white? No, it is not a black and white. So, for example, it is not the Aztecs. It has not yet happened on 20 questions of the story of the week. This is the 20 questions answer. <laughs> Question two. Okay, I'm just. I, all, right, all right, is is it is it classic who? Yes, it is. All right. Question three. Would Eric Sayward be anywhere near it? Thank God, no, Eric. Sayward <laughs> okay, so that gets, they heard that weeds out a couple of years of Doctor Who. Is it? Does it star a Doctor Who? I get really tired of. I can't answer that because I, from week to week, I never remember who your least favorite doctors are. Fourth doctor. It does feature a doctor you're really, really, really tired of. Yes. Question five. Okay, so that narrows it down. Is my is the the greatest companion Sarah Jane in it? No, the greatest companion Sarah Jane is not in it. All right. Is Leela in it? No, Leela, who's also a great companion, is not in it. I think we're at question seven yeah. now. I'm flying by. Is it? Is it either of the Romanas? Yes, it is either of the Romanas. So now you've narrowed it down to three and a half years of television. Is it the prettier one? That's very subjective, man. I know who... I know. Is it Mary Tam? No offense to Lala Ward, but Mary Tam is just... <laughs> no, it is not Mary Tam. It is Lala Ward. Question eight. All right. All right. Is it... Um, is it in season 17? Yes, it is in season 17. It's now we're at question nine, and you're gonna win because there are fewer stories to choose from than questions remaining. Do you remember which one I picked as mine when me and Jeff did 17 or ratings? Yeah, I listened to you and Jeff on Runcible Report, and I think this is your favorite season 17 story, if I recall correctly. Yeah, is it Creature of the Pit? It is Creature from the it Pit. It is my favorite, and I don't know why because one, it's funny as shit. It is just absolutely funny, intentionally and really inappropriately. <laughs> I had Fraser on as my guest for that one. We spent the whole hour not talking about the Arado problem because there's so much wonderful stuff in Creature from the Pit. And that's kind of what me and Jeff just were talking about. For all that, which is silly as hell. The, the, the scene in part four of Creature when the Doctor and Romana are communicating only by using the word yes is possibly the best scene in the entire classic series, all 26 years. That is a genius that's, level. Yes, story. that's. And that was Douglas Adams because it's it not in the David Fisher novelization. That is all Douglas Adams. I love that one. I love that story. So I, I do really like that. I do prefer. I do kind of like that season now, except for uh, Nightmare of Eden. Yeah, that one doesn't quite work. Well-meaning, but doesn't quite work. With the big giant red button in the elevator. What? <laughs> I mean, it's not just like it's a little too big. It's four feet. I also think Shada is overrated, but with the caveat, I have not seen the episodic version of Shada on the latest season 17 Blu-ray. I don't think Shada is as good as people say it is. It's better. It's better than I, than I think it's better than I 
thought of it with all the other versions of shot of like this is bad i think it's not bad i just think it's an uh, average 70s tom baker doctor on the omnibus shot of dvd some of the episodes would run 29 minutes between where the part two cliffhanger was and the part three cliffhanger if you knock it down to 24 minutes per part maybe it works better but i don't know if they've done that on the on the uh, blu-ray episodic version no and you know it's there's so many versions of it it's i normally sell my dvds when the blu-ray set comes out yeah but I didn't on that because there's a version on oh the thirty years in the TARDIS is on that right, DVD right, right. in the DVD set so I don't they didn't they didn't put it in there so uh, chat Chris's head I think he said that everything that was on the DVDs will eventually come out on a Blu-ray set right but not always in the it may order. may not be with the stuff it was originally we're gonna put all the action strip for actions will probably be on one yeah. which will be lovely. And the girls of the 60s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, which I thought were three really good. Yeah, yeah, and the yeah. unit family ones were really – they did some really good work already. And the stuff they're putting on the sets are just, oh, mind-blowing. My two favorite documentaries, Love Off Air, which is the fans who recorded the 60s series on audio. I love that one. follow-up to that, Checks, Lies, and Videotape about the DVD – so the VHS market in the 1980s. And then the closing credits – for checks, lies, and videotape is the 2005 closing credits, but VCR quality with tracking lines running across the screen, which is the way most of us watched Doctor Who in the 80s. Oh, yeah, yeah. VHS yeah, copies good. with tracking lines. So those are my two favorite documentaries in the entire DVD range. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the season 20 set's going to probably be amazing. No, I'm getting I'm getting that in the UK version. I'll be getting that in region two. It's the biggest one they've done because I was looking at how many – D, D, DVDs I've got on the shelf that it's gonna that go away. It's like that's gonna be huge. Just gonna be like nine, ten di- nine thousand pages of BD raw material between rehearsal scripts, camera scripts, transmission scripts, production note files. I'm gonna be spending a lot of time reading season twenty as well as watching it. Oh, that's cool. That's very cool. All right, I realize you got to go, my man. Thank you so much. I'm have, having you back on for a few weeks for the next John Luca writer novelization. We'll have a lot more to say about Doctor Who, Marco Polo. I think I'm going to have to watch that little mini version of it. <laughs> well, thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. Doctor Who, The Aztecs by John Luca Roddy, televised as The Aztecs, teleplay by John Luca Roddy, televised in May and June 1964, paperback release date. September 20th, 1984, target book number 88, cover artist Nick Spender. Getting It Right by Kate Orman, 1992. The Aztecs is one of the very first Doctor Who stories, and one for which I have tremendous respect. On a shoestring budget without benefit of video editing or location filming, the production team brought to life a Shakespearean tale of good versus evil. It's a pity, then, that the very basis of the story is a mistake. The Aztecs didn't build tombs, they cremated their dead. And they didn't believe in reincarnation, at least not in human form. Warriors might return to the earth as hummingbirds when they'd finished serving the sun. On screen, there are a number of little boo-boos. The camera colliding with the sacrificial altar in episode one. The mispronunciation of names, the X should be pronounced sh the little white gloves dangling down from Trotoxel's wrists. Someone had obviously seen a picture of an Aztec priest wearing the skin of a sacrificial victim, his own hands protruding from the sacrifice's wrists. But none of these detract from the story. It's not really about the Aztecs, but about superstition clashing with compassion. So long as the impression of accuracy is given, actual accuracy isn't so important. However, when John Lucarotti novelised his script in 1984, it turned out that he didn't really know much about the Aztec people after all. For example, quote, It's an Aztec mask of Quetzalcoatl, the sun god, who was driven into exile by Huitzilopochtli, the god of darkness. Page 3. That single sentence contains five errors, six if you include the fact that the televised mask showed Huitzilopochtli's face. Quetzalcoatl, spelt wrong, was not the sun god. Huitzilopochtli, spelt wrong, was, and Quetzalcoatl was driven into exile by the god Tezcatlipoca. Further perusing the tomb, Susan discovers a wall painting of warriors, quote, from their mouths came bubbles filled with hieroglyphs, page four, 
Unfortunately, the Aztecs lacked writing as well as the wheel. John Lucarotti was probably thinking of the Maya, who did have a hieroglyphic system of writing, or the ancient Egyptians. In fact, he seems to have had the Egyptian pyramids in mind when he added a tomb and, quote, interior, page 20, to Aztec temples, which were solid except for the little god houses on the top. Totoxel's behaviour, too, is odd. Quote, the high priest picked up the jug, filled the goblet and drank the wine in a single draught, page 17. The Aztecs had no wine, only a drink called octli made from fermented cactus juice and to drink it outside of special circumstances was punishable by death. He also goes to, quote, visit the barracks to select a victim when the gods demand blood. Page 21. The Aztecs sacrificed those who were captured during their war campaigns against the other peoples of the Valley of Mexico, and special slaves, not their own warriors. The other tribes, in turn, might sacrifice captured Aztec soldiers. The warriors are portrayed as having metal swords, quote, the sword was drawn and the tip touching Ian's stomach. The chosen warrior slid the sword back into its scabbard, page 37. In fact, the Aztec sword was a long, thin wooden club, rather like a cricket bat, studded down the sides with sharp chunks of the volcanic glass obsidian. These bulky weapons couldn't be fitted into a scabbard. There's one memorable scene in the televised story where Ixtar fights with what appears to be a short club with two loops on one end. In fact, it's an atl atl, the equivalent of a woomera or spear thrower. Presumably no one realised what it was. Other little errors are scattered through the text. The steam house, used frequently by the Aztecs to clean themselves, has mysteriously moved inside and become the, quote, bathroom, page 44. Criminals were stoned or strangled, not crucified, page 106. And this attempt to sneak Christianity into the book is rather embarrassing, especially given that the conquistadors used religion as an excuse to wipe out the Mexicans and their devil-worshipping civilization. Another confusing point is the extent of the Aztec sacrifices. By 1507, the date given in the novel, large-scale sacrifices were quite normal. The dedication of the great temple in the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan, 20 years earlier, had cost between 20 and 80,000 lives. Yet Barbara hints that the, quote, thousands who die in a single day were victims of the Aztecs' last ditch attempt to placate the gods and drive off the Spanish, page 51. They were much too busy fighting the Spanish to indulge in mass human sacrifice, though some Spanish soldiers did end up on the altar. The writer W. H. Auden once said that you can't review a bad book without showing off. But none of the above facts are obscure. Most of the information John Lucarotti needed to paint an accurate picture of the Aztecs would have been in a good children's book, and it's a shame he didn't bone up more before putting pen to paper. But the televised story remains a classic example of what Doctor Who can do with two painted backdrops and a handful of shillings. He is hoping for a prompt Australian release of the BBC video. Well, I wrote that in 1992, and looking back at it, I think I'm extremely cocky to be nitpicking one of the greatest Doctor Who stories. I, uh, I'd love to know what some of the, the sources that John Lucarotti used were for his research. And I'd also like to know how accurate some of my nitpicks are. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. P.S. I apologise for my pronunciation of the Aztec names. My thanks to Kate Orman for her contributions to this episode. Two curious facts about the Aztec novelization from where I sit. One, this is almost unique among my complete set of targets, in that I never marked off the cliffhangers. Never. Not sure why. I always marked off the cliffhangers, though my lines of demarcation evolved over the years. At first, I would draw lines in red ink under the cliffhanger moment, later on the episode numeral written in pencil, for many Hartnells, I wrote up the full next episode title. Here, I did none of that. No red line, no numeral two or episode two, not even the Warriors of Death. Not that cliffhangers mattered much to John Lucarotti. All three of his books have a cavalier attitude to TV cliffhangers, most notably in the back third of Marco Polo and the back three quarters of The Massacre, which are yet to come. In this, his first and most faithful adaptation, all three TV cliffhangers are present, but they all fall in mid-chapter, not like Terence Dix, who always placed his cliffhangers with clockwork-like regularity, usually at the ends of chapters 3, 6, and 9. In fact, Lucarati writes in 15 chapters, 
a number not even divisible by four episodes. So if you don't know where the TV cliffhangers are, you'll have a hard time guessing them just by reading the novelization first. Stepping back for a broader view, this is a watershed moment for the Targets. This is not the first book as part of the Targets' new completed mission. That would have been The Dominators, episode 86. The Aztecs is the second book of this new push, but it is the first to be adapted by its original author. By 1984, Mervyn Hazeman and Henry Lincoln were long gone from Doctor Who. Lincoln found a larger audience two years earlier with the publication of Holy Blood, Holy Grail, as it was titled here in the States, which makes a big miss for Big Finish, as they have yet to produce a Dead Set Monastery audio adventure entitled Holy Blood, Holy Ganta, well, that I'm aware of. So The Dominators was adapted by a reliable grindhouse author, Ian Martyr. But Luca Roddy comes back, 17 years after his final televised TV script, The Massacre, differed quite wildly from what he'd submitted to the production office. But that's a story for another day. And it's also a decade after his script for The Ark got rewritten by Robert Holmes into The Ark in Space, though Luca Roddy's version did at least receive a big finish airing recently. Luca Roddy was a big part of my childhood, my own Doctor Who fandom, primarily via the novelization of Marco Polo, my first Luca Roddy book. And that comes up on this show in another six weeks or so. I vividly recall the first time that I watched the Aztecs on Long Island PBS in late 1985. Richard Rodney Bennett's percussive score lodged in my head for weeks after that. I wasn't aware at the time, but Bennett was living in New York City and already had several Oscar nominations under his belt. All I knew was that when I rode my bicycle around my subdivision, sometimes the bike chains would make a rattling noise, much like the score accompanying Ian and Ixta's fights. I got the Aztecs novelization a little bit later on in fandom, after I'd already read, and reread, and then re-reread Marco Polo. And this is the least remarkable of Lucarati's three books, because it is the one that's most faithful to the TV scripts. Part 1 opens with a TARDIS scene. The TV story does not feature any TARDIS scenes, making it the first Doctor Who story in televised order to make such a claim. The dialogue in Chapter 1 is original to the book, with Ian making a meta-joke about hoping the TARDIS lands in the 1980s, when the book was written, in, quote, an aerospace factory where the TARDIS could be thoroughly overhauled. Ian also alliteratively worries about, quote, being devoured by a dinosaur or dictated to by a Dalek. Ian is also said to be only 28 years old, where William Russell was pushing 40 in real life. Chapter 1 otherwise plays out very similar to the TV, same scenes in the same order, although Luca Roddy names all the Aztec gods who on TV are described only by their job titles. And thanks to the very helpful chapter title in Kate's novel The Left-Handed Hummingbird for the pronunciation of Huitzilopochtli, Luca Roddy preserves the wicked thread of humor running through Hartnell's Doctor, with the Doctor, as on TV, getting everyone's names wrong. That's a long-running scripted element of Hartnell's character. Hartnell even tut-tuts in a one-sentence paragraph on page 14. Quote, aged indeed, he thought. In the next chapter, the Doctor has a horrified moment when he realizes he needs to climb all the temple stairs to reach Barbara. Lucarotti also adds backstory to Kamika, that she sold vegetables in the marketplace, but that her eyes, quote, were everywhere, missing nothing. The book also adds an extra generation to Ixta's family tree, making him the grandson rather than the son of the builder of Yataxa's temple. And bearing in mind Kate's correction about the letter X in its pronunciation, I am opting to use the TV pronunciations here. On page 21, Ian sees 200 Aztec warriors training. 200? Heck, I think if you add up the cast lists and extras for every Doctor Who story in season 1 altogether, you wouldn't reach 200 people. In the next chapter, Ian estimates that 10 to 15,000 Aztec citizens are present for the human sacrifice. The dialogue at the end of chapter 3 is, annoyingly, a little differently worded from the crackling TV confrontation between Barbara and the Doctor. Words that we all know by heart. What is it? What's happened? There has to be a human sacrifice today at the rain ceremony. Oh, no. And you must not interfere. Do you understand? I can't just sit by and watch. No, Barbara. Ian agrees with me. He's got to escort the victim to the altar. He has to what? Yes, they've made him a warrior. And he's promised me not to interfere with the sacrifice. Well, they've made me a goddess. 
And I forbid it. Barbara, no. There'll be no sacrifice this afternoon, Doctor. Or ever again. The reincarnation of your taxa will prove to the people that you don't need to sacrifice a human being in order to make it rain. Barbara, no. It's no good, Doctor. My mind's made up. This is the beginning of the end of the sun god. What are you talking about? Oh, don't you see? If I could start the destruction of everything that's evil here, then everything that is good would survive when Cortes lands. But you can't rewrite history. Not one line. Barbara, the high priests are coming. Barbara, one last appeal. What you are trying to do is utterly impossible. I know. Believe me. I know. While I have painful memories of epic run-on sentences in Luca Ruiti's novelization of The Massacre, this book generally has pretty direct sentences and strong observational humor. The Doctor, page 31, quote, thought that the whole ceremony would be ridiculous if it were not so gruesome, as no one 250 feet below in the square could possibly hear a word Aunt Locke said. The episode 1 cliffhanger falls on mid-page 33. The brief paragraph representing the cliffhanger is good, but not John Ringham delivering his monologue direct to camera good. In case you were wondering why this story is considered Shakespearean in tone. And the words, again, are slightly different in the book. The prose is effective. It tells the story, such as Lucarides' musings on what it means for less experienced time travelers to play gods. Page 34. Barbara buried her face in her hands, her body racked with sobs. The doctor stood by uncomfortably, and his anger turned in on himself. He had been unreasonable, and he knew it. Barbara's experience of traveling through time and space was extremely limited. His was considerable, to say the least. He could become a Babylonian deity at the drop of his hat. But for Barbara to have the role of an Aztec god thrust upon her must be very difficult. More humor on page 36, as the doctor notes how Tlatoxel demotes him from the aged servant of Yataxa to, quote, the old man. Ross and I earlier discussed Elizabeth Sandifer's essay on the Aztecs, describing the story as pro-colonialist and imperialist, the Aztecs being portrayed as noble savages. Ian gets a good moment in the novelization at the top of chapter 5, noting that Ixta would make a good player on the pub darts team. But on the other hand, Ian, smirking at Ixta, that he can defeat the Aztec warrior with just his thumb, is a bit of smugness. 20th century scholar looking down on 15th century soldier, as if 20th century white males have anything to be smug about. The Aztecs is Walter Randall's first of many small Doctor Who roles throughout the show's first 11 seasons, though his characters have already been seen in many novelizations in the first 87 books. Lucarati in Book 88 describes him as short, portly, balding, and waddling. Page 39. Oh, snap! Interestingly, Tanila is not even in that scene on TV. It's a different character instead, the Aztec captain. On page 43, Lucarati answers definitely the question, did the doctor really love Kamika? Quote, as she hurried away, the doctor sighed. He had a sense of guilt because, much as he liked Kamika, he knew he was using her. And does the end justify the means? He asked himself. In this instant, definitely yes. The thought was resolute, but the guilt still there. Editorial note, Lucarati on page 43 uses a different word than there, but when you see the actual word in the book, you will see why I did not choose to pronounce it for this podcast. Coming back to Lucarati's prose, I like the way he ends chapters on terse sentences of disquiet, as opposed to Terence, who built many cliffhangers out of reaction shots or pauses in the action. Here, chapters end like so. Quote, the Aztecs always show the utmost courtesy to their intended victims, the doctor observed icily, and continued pacing the room. Barbara was shaken. She knew the shock had shown in her eyes, and she also knew that Tlatoxel had seen it. There was no better way to destroy one's enemies than to let them destroy themselves. On page 46, Susan, praised for learning a lesson in Aztec seminary, privately steams. Susan wondered if the priest of knowledge would like to know about Einstein's theory of relativity. If only Susan had been written more moments like that on TV. Lucarati does a good job describing the Ian Ixta fight throughout Chapter 7. Ixta using his Aztec warrior knowledge, Ian using a mixture of Eastern martial arts and British TV wrestling. 
but Lucarati again buries the Episode 2 cliffhanger in mid-chapter. Because this is a short book, just 121 pages, there's not a lot of time for subtlety. There are some noisy sentences, like on page 61, quote, Barbara's appearance remained serene, but her heart ached, and she was in mental anguish. Lucarati only uses two of the serial's episode titles for chapter titles, Episodes 3 and 4, The Bride of Sacrifice, and The Day of Darkness. Episode 3, by the way, was the first ever Doctor Who story to crack the top 20 in the TV rankings. Chapter 9, The Bride of Sacrifice chapter, has some interesting alterations from the TV. On TV, there's a scene between Ian and Barbara, one that happens again in Hartnell-era historicals, similarly in The Reign of Terror, where Ian ethers the Aztecs with dialogue that surely informs the Sandifer reading of the story as pro-colonial, pro-imperialist. Why do you take such risks? Because I overheard something that Latoxel said to Tonilla. Tonilla? I didn't know they were allies. They're planning something against you. I'm sure of it. I'll watch them both. Latoxel's dangerous. He seems able to bring people around to his way of thinking. Oh, you've got it all wrong, Barbara. All the people here share Latoxel's views. What about Ortlock? I'm sick and tired of all this arguing and quarreling. First the doctor and now you. Why can't you see what I'm trying to do? I can. Well, you're not helping. The Toxel's evil, and you'll make everyone else the same. They are the same, Barbara. That's the whole point. You keep on insisting that Latoxel's the odd man out, but he isn't. I don't believe it. Well, you must. If only you could stand away from this thing, you'd see it clearly. Ortlock's the extraordinary man here. He's the reasonable one, the civilized one, the one that's prepared to listen to advice. But he's one man, Barbara. One man. Lucarati has Barbara stammer after she narrowly evades a poisoning attempt. Stammering was often used for comic effect in the 1980s and earlier. I saw it all the time in kids' comics, the ones I grew up with. But you would no longer see stammering written to denote nervousness or fear anymore, I don't think. Chapter 10 begins with a five-page scene, with the newly engaged Doctor and Kamika talking in the garden. At cross purposes, her waxing rhapsodic about love on a garden of our own, him looking for a secret tunnel that leads from the garden to Eutax's tomb, wherein lies the TARDIS, and then segues into the doctor excitedly visiting Ian in army barracks to tell him about the tunnel. The other dialogue in this chapter again contains some variations from TV. In the book, Barbara realizes that Tlatoxel is trying to trap her verbally, with this tale of the disobedient Aztec maiden who must be punished. On TV, Barbara asks if Otlock witnessed the offense, and Tlatoxel, John Ringham is so good in this, responds that it must be true. Exactly the thing a schemer would say, to make it seem as if he and his opposite number are on the same page. And yet, that line is not in the book, nor is there any equivalent. Chapter 11, Crawl, Swim, Climb, is the biggest expansion of the TV story. Lucarati narrates the Doctor and Ian's midnight garden adventure from the POV of a lurking Ixta, and there's a nice bit where Ixta is shot by the Doctor's use of a pen flashlight. Ixta and the Doctor have a longer conversation about the former's fear of Ian, his rival for command, and the Doctor promising to intervene with the Ataxa to have Ian stand down from the leadership duel. And Ian's ordeal to climb through the secret tunnel to the inside of the pyramid is much harder I admit I got lost trying to follow the geography of the pyramid interior, but it's a much better physical effort, with Ian nearly drowning. On TV, his feet merely get wet at the Part 3 cliffhanger, and then having to the chimney up a 240-foot shaft. We learn what really happens to Ixta's father, page 90. In one corner was a white, circular object. Ian reached out and picked it up. It was a human skull. With a shutter, he put it back on the ledge and shone the light onto the water in the chamber. On the bottom, he could see bits and pieces of a disintegrated human skeleton. I know who you are, Ian thought. Ixta's father. Chapter 12's extra scenes involve Barbara having a graphic nightmare about the torturing of Susan, the death of Ian, and the doctor going insane. The doctor also tells Barbara that he thinks Ian is dead. There's no such moment on TV. This dream sequence is psychological horror, and it's a good use of the limited extra space that a novelization affords its writer. Chapter 12 ends with a terrible joke about Ixta abandoning the Aztec gods for the Greek god of Morpheus. 
The 80s and 90s were full of action heroes delivering terrible quips to vanquished villains. Heck, even Arnold in one 1990s movie shoots dead an alligator in the Central Park Zoo and announces, Your luggage! I swear I am not making that up. Before I get to the next bit, let me play you some audio from Aunt Locke's final scene with Barbara in TV's episode 4, The Day of Darkness. I thank you for attending me, Ortlock. Such gratitude is due to Kameka. Then thank her for me. My servant did not strike you, Ortlock. The evidence we have proves she did. If that is true, then I am unworthy of your trust. Of all people, Ortlock, why should I harm you? No, there's some plan here. Who would benefit most by breaking up our friendship? Clotoxel. Clotoxel hates you, I know that, and Ixtar does his bidding. And I am bewildered by the things that happen. I have many doubts, but in this matter, I must believe you. As for the others, I, I do not know if you are Yataksa. I do not know what you are. My servants are in danger. Will you see them die? Your handmaiden I may be able to protect, but the young man, Ian, is too closely guarded. He didn't strike you, Ortlock. He didn't. I cannot save him. That scene is adapted for chapter 13 albeit with heavy alterations and many questionable cultural remarks. Page 102, quote, The new curtain was blood red, with the head of Huitzilopochtli woven with gold thread in the center. Rays of sunshine radiated from it, but the face was sinister, the eyes cruel and the mouth hard. Barbara looked at it and knew that the sooner they were quit of the Aztecs, the better. Come on, Barbara, step your game up. Scared of a curtain? And then on page 106, in dialogue not televised in the clip I just played you, Barbara yells at Otlock, What manner of people are you who wallow in virtue and in bestiality? You Aztecs are schizophrenic. Insert record scratch sound. Ugh, so much wrong there. And then, of course, the crucifixion bit, which Kate already dismantled for us. Chapter 13 removes a couple of things I like from the TV. Gone is Ixta's blurting out that Otlock was struck from behind which Ian realizes Ixta would only know if he was the assailant. Also gone is Tlatoxel's vision of walling up the false goddess Yataxa alive. A gruesome thought, but one the American Gothic horror soap opera Dark Shadows would portray on television in March 1968. Dark Shadows writers were more likely to have been inspired by Edgar Allan Poe than Lucarati, by the way. The final chapters make a couple of big changes. Susan's punishment is to be blinded, her eyes gouged out. We learned this several times towards the end of the book. That's not on TV. On a bigger note, Ian's defeat of Ixta is differently staged via the return of the pen flashlight mentioned above. Here, instead of defeating Ixta with fists and feet, Ian uses the flashlight to frighten both Ixta and Tlatoxel, and it's that which causes Ixta to fall from the parapet to his death. Speaking of added deaths, the Aztec capstan is killed off screen on TV, but appears to be spared that fate in the book. And Tlatoxel concludes the story with one extra sentence not seen on camera. The end of chapter 15, quote, He plunged the knife into the perfect victim's chest. Next time on Doctor Who Literature, we go from one of the most acclaimed stories of the 1960s to one of the most acclaimed stories of the 1970s, one of the most highly regarded William Hartnell outings, to one of the most highly regarded John Pertwee outings, and we go from New York to Los Angeles to an episode recorded live with David Barsky, Book 89, Doctor Who, Inferno. The only question is, which of us loves Inferno more? At times, it's hard to tell. Thank you for joining me on another episode of the Doctor Who Literature Podcast. This podcast is produced by David Barsky, Jim Sangster, and yours truly. This week's episode was co-written by Kate Orman and edited by me. Our logo was designed by Jim Sangster. Special thanks to my special guest, Ross from Gallifrey's Most Wanted. This podcast can be found on most of your podcast apps of choice. You can find all past episodes at podcasters.spotify.com slash pod slash show slash Doctor Who Lit. It really helps if you rate five stars and subscribe. 
You can find me on Twitter at Doctor Who Novels, that's DR Who Novels, on Mastodon, that DR Who Novels at Mastodon.social, and on email at Doctor Who Literature, that's DR Who Literature at gmail.com. Please drop me a line with your comments, questions, and suggestions. Thank you for listening, and whatever you do, keep turning the pages. Doctor Who Podcast Network.